I was forced into the 21st century today because my printer stopped working. So I have my whole message on this. So I, I kind of think this might be the way I do it now because when I'm practicing, I was like, this is like so much easier than fumbling through papers. But anyway, if I can get it to work. Not everybody. Yeah, man, it's crazy. Right. By the way, I love the fact that they, that they do this here in Moses, that they uh, print out all, all the verses. The last time, I didn't have time to, to call in because for some reason, God always gives me my messages, it seems like, at the very last second because I like to tweak his messages and he doesn't like it to, I guess. But uh, <laughs> so I don't have time to fix it, you know. Um, but this time, you know, I, I, got, I got done just in time to actually call up Alicia and give her all the verses I was going to use, which I think is awesome because I don't like to, to give people enough time to look up the verses sometimes. I used to get criticized a lot. I don't think that'll happen as much nowadays because everybody got the Bible on tap and phone and they can get to it faster than I can with the Bible. But I used to get criticized a lot because I didn't give people enough time. But here's the thing. God gave me about a two-hour message. <laughs> they taught me in Bible school. This is Robert. I said this last time. This is actually the classroom that I went to Bible college at. And uh, the room where, where I went to Bible college. But they taught us it's better to take a, a two hour message and cram it into 45 minutes than what most preachers do, which is take a 20 minute message and cram it into <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to cram, I'm going to try to cram this into about 45 minutes. So that means. Uh, you know, I'm glad you got to look up some of the scriptures later. <coughs> but the first one, you've already got to open this one, though, is John chapter 10, which is kind of unique that he wanted to preach out that, because that is the very first one. This is the uh, uh, the main scripture, what do they call that? Text? The, uh, no. I used to be a preacher. <laughs> foundational text? The scripture? No, it's not a That's good enough. We'll go with that. This is the foundational scripture of this message. John chapter 10, verse 4. And it's in red, so we know that Jesus said it. He said, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. That's one of, one of the ways that, that, that Jesus identifies the Christian is that they know his voice. This message is about knowing his voice. It's about knowing the voice of God. To be more specific, this message is about knowing his word. And to be absolutely clear, this message is about knowing his word to enhance your recognition of his voice. If you don't know his word, you don't know his voice. That's something I, I, I'm going to try to teach and approve in this message. Uh, I was going to do something really mean. This is something I actually used to do. You guys have no idea how blessed you are that this is years later and I've matured. I used to be a young preacher with an attitude problem, and I used to love fooling people. I was going to ask y'all, don't do it, because there is no book of Hezekiah, but I was going to ask y'all to, to go to Hezekiah chapter 3, verse 5. <laughs> and then I was going to mumble and just talk about whatever for the next three minutes. That's what I used to do. I'd talk about, you know, like my dog or talk about what I did that day or whatever, because I knew nobody was paying attention. They was they was desperately trying to find this kind of old testament. People were going back to their looking through their index. <laughs> Ninety-five percent of the church. Every time I did this all over the United States for a message. Some of the churches the pastor wasn't paying attention because he was busy flipping <laughs> 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 That's that. There is no book of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king in the Old Testament, so it sounds like it's something that, like, you know, 66 books. It could be a book of Hezekiah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes they're looking at me like, is he preaching out of a Catholic Bible with the next few hours? <laughs> no. Not even in those books is there a book of Hezekiah. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and the reason why it works, uh, I thought about this story. I, I thought real hard about saying the name of the celebrity because I'm not going to say anything real bad about it, but you know, I'm not going to because my brother take recorded messages go um, be on Facebook. But um, I just said, there's a celebrity, a show that I love to watch. And uh, this celebrity who's not a preacher, it's a show about something else, but he's a godly man. He's a very good man and, and he, he talks about Jesus and he actually prays for people and everything else and every once in a while he, he quotes the Bible. Every once in a while, he thinks that he quotes the Bible. 
I, I think this is an exceptionally good man, and I, and I generally admire him. And the reason why I generally admire him is because there's that one pet peeve about him. He keeps quoting the Bible, and he don't know the Bible. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't even say, he won't say the Bible teaches. Now, if he said the Bible teaches and then says something that ain't nowhere in the Bible, then maybe I might be able to think, well, maybe he put together a whole bunch of scripture to come up with that nonsense. <coughs> you know, but he'll say the Bible says, and he'll say something, and it'll be something that sounds real biblical. Or real biblical. You know, I mean, it sounds good. You know, every time. And I showed a Facebook status. Now, one time I was watching a show, I had to be so much wrong. It's a big long Facebook. Facebook every once in a while. You know, what's the blue moon? I'll write a long Facebook status. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of Facebook friends in here. Anyway, most of my Facebook statuses are like that long. But I wrote a long face, a longer than usual Facebook status about this one, saying, you know, no wonder people nowadays don't believe half of what the Bible says. People, people nowadays don't believe half, half of what the Bible says. When I said the reason why people don't believe half of what the Bible says nowadays is because half of what the Bible says it doesn't really say. Half of what people have been led to believe by celebrities, by preachers, by other Christians, that the Bible says, they're, they're just they're just parroting. They're, they're quoting something they heard somebody else quote. And uh, that's what this, this man that I look up to. This this I, I love to watch his show, but I hate it when he quotes scripture. Because he's quoting the book of, I can't say his name. <laughs> because I don't want to put him, put him out there. And... Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't that. I know that guy on the Duck Show, whatever the Duck Show. I know he's close to Bible too. It's not him. But I'll say that because I know he's in the news and all that, so it might. I'm not talking about him. But you know, a Christian like that, I guarantee you, if he was in this in this congregation, if I said turn to Hezekiah chapter three verse five, this whole time he'd still been looking, because I can tell by the verses that he quotes that he doesn't know the Bible, because he quotes all kinds of stuff that ain't in the Bible. The average Christian, and the, the reason why. So many people just take it by faith. When he says it's true, it's because the average Christian, I, I, I wrote down two statistical facts that I remember from 10 years ago. It might have changed. Man, I hope it changed. I hope it didn't change for the worst. But 10 years ago, I remember looking it up. Two statistical facts about Christians that are shocking and appalling. Number one, 95% of Bible believing Christians. Now, when I say Christian, I'm not talking about the average American that says they're a Christian. This was a survey done among people who uh, profess to be a member of a local church. People that go to church regularly, people that claim to read their Bibles, people that are, are straight out Christians, like you and me. 95% of them have never led another person to Christ. That is the Great Commission. 95%, 19 out of 20, Christians have never led another person to Christ. Another thing is appalling, the exact same statistic, again, this was 10 years old, 95% of the church Christians have never read the Bible from cover to cover. 95% of Christians have not read the most supernatural book that this world has ever known. The most supernatural book that this world will ever know. According to our doctrine. This ain't a, a popular belief. This is according to our own doctrine. What we believe is the most supernatural book that the world has ever known and the world will ever know. Most of us, 19 out of 20 of us. It's about 20 of us in this room. There's 20. There's exactly 20. Well, see, if that statistic were, were to be, you know, if that statistic were to be, were to be flat out and represented in this room, that means none of y'all, because I've read the Bible from cover to cover. I'm the one out, out of 20. So that would mean, if you look, every, every group of this size, 19 of them, and I, and I hope that's not the case with this room, but every group this size, 19 of them, the entire congregation has never read the Bible from cover to cover. I was having a conversation with my girlfriend the other night, and I, and I told her that she knows the Bible better than most Christians. And the reason why I said it is because she's read a lot of books. <coughs> you know, she hasn't read the whole, she's a very young Christian. I was, I was, you know, admiring her because she's only about six months old in the Lord since, since rededicating. And she's already read quite a few books of the Bible. And I told her, I said, do you realize that all you had read by now is just one book out of the Old Testament and one book out of the New Testament? There's not statistic. You would know more about the Bible than 50% of the church. According to statistics 10 years ago, 50% of the church has not read at least one book out of each of the, you know, like the first book, Genesis, and the first book, Matthew. 50% of the church haven't even done that. Haven't even read, but, you know, she knows a lot more. But if, if, even if that, if that was all that you read, if all you've read is just one book of the, New, of the Old Testament, one book of the New Testament, you would know more than the average Christian. But that's not really a compliment. That would be like saying, say, uh, uh, take a man that's like severely nearsighted. 
to the point that he can see images, vague colors. He knows a lot more about what things look like than a, than a totally blind man. But he's still blind. If all you read is one book out of the Old Testament, one book out of the New Testament, you're still severely lacking in your Bible knowledge. But that's 50% of the church. 95% of the church hasn't read the Bible cover to cover. 50% of the church hasn't even read two books of the Bible. And uh, I remember when this used to baffle me because I read the Bible from cover to cover before I got saved. I got saved as a result. I was in jail, and then you guys I heard my testimony before, and I read the Bible from cover to cover, trying to you know, pretend to be a Christian so I can make trust that you guys know that story. But um, I read the Bible before I got saved, and then after I got saved, I got saved pretty much as a result of that and a preaching of a man by the name of Max Hoseline. But and then after I got saved, I read the Bible from cover to cover again because I, I loved it. And uh, then I read it from cover to cover again. Nobody had told me, you know, that you're supposed to start in the book of John. And then, you know, I just read it from Genesis to Revelation. When I was done, I closed it, opened it back up at the beginning, and read it from Genesis to Revelation again. The first time I read it in 30 days. The second time I read it in six months, so forth and so on. One time I read it in 10 days. You have to read it from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep to do that. But I was in, I was locked up. So. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was in jail jail. Like, not just jail, I was in jail, jail. Jail, jail, and solitary. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the hole. So I was in the hole with Lansing for, for, and so for 10 days. And the library was convinced that, that I had checked out a book from Maximum Security, Lansing's library. I was in minimum security at the time. There's no, I had never been to Maximum Security as a library. So he was just a jerk and wouldn't give me a book. Because I supposedly checked a book out from a library I'd never been to before. But, so, but I got a Bible from the, uh, the chaplain, and that's all I had to do. And I read it through in two days. But so I, I've read the Bible from cover to cover many times. So I, I used to wonder why I have so many Christians and I read this book is so powerful. I've gotten so much out of it. It's blessed me in so many different ways, spiritually, physically, financially, on and on and on. Why have so many Christians not read this word? And if you go up and ask the average person why Christians don't read the Bible from cover to cover, most people will say it's because they're lazy. Obviously, right? I always disagree with that. I don't think it's because Chris is lazy, and I can prove it. Because if the most booming business in Christianity right now, what is that? I'm going to let Derek take a shot. What do you think the most booming Christian business is? Bookstores. Bookstores. Christian bookstores. If you go to any major city in America, there's at least one Christian bookstore. Sometimes there's ten. Christian bookstores are big business. Christian bookstores are making money. Hand over foot to make money because Christians love books. You go to any Christ, you know, one of the ways you can, one of the ways you can know if you're in a Christian's house nowadays is look around. You'll see Christian books. Even the worst Christian that only go to church one a month, you'll see a pair of Jabez laying off in the corner somewhere. Christians love to read books. And they read books and I mean they, they buy all kinds of books. But uh Vanessa got a library already. I mean, a huge library that we're going to have to donate to Goodwill because we're going to have a one bedroom apartment. You know I mean, it ain't going to fit. It's <laughs> not going to happen. I don't want to start arguing later. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, Christians love books. So why are Christians reading all of these books from Christian bookstores, but they're not reading the Bible? One answers the other. The reason why Christians read all of these books from, from Christian bookstores. And the reason why Christians are not reading the Bible, the, the, reason they're reading, the reason they're reading all these books is because they're not reading the Bible. It's because they're reading these books about the Bible. What do they sell in Christian bookstores? They sell books about the Bible. So Christians won't read the Bible, the average Christian, but they read a book about the Bible. And so this message is, is to, to talk go over some of the reasons why Christians will read about the Bible, but they won't read the Bible themselves. They want someone else to teach them God's Word. Wow. That's what it is. Wow. We as a church have delegated that responsibility to learn God's voice to someone else, to a, a great author, to a great pastor, to your preacher, to your teacher, to your mama, whoever. You want that person to read the Bible for you and then teach it to you. So <coughs> that. There are three reasons that Christians don't read God's word. That's what this message is about. Number one, too much trust. I want you to turn to the second scripture is Acts chapter 17, verse 11. I can't read the whole chapter, but to get some context, it's talking about the Bereans. And Paul was, was teaching them. Verse 11 says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. And if they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to 
find out whether these things were so. Luke is commending the Bereans because they, they, they searched the scriptures because somebody was teaching them something and they're like, nah, nah, we ain't just going to take this dude's word for it. We're going to look it up. We're going to verify what he says. Sure, now let me talk about the dude that they're looking up and what they thought of this dude. The church in that day. This is Paul the Apostle that's teaching them this. Just so you know a little bit about Paul the Apostle and what the church thought of him. Paul the Apostle was probably the most famous Christian in the church in that day. They were all talking about him. He started out a song rescue the church. And all of a sudden he's preaching the gospel. That was big news. It flooded the church. He's At the time he's writing the Bible. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Paul's word was so respected. His teachings were so respected that when... We actually know when Paul's writing, when his epistles became recognized by the church as epistles. Became recognized, I mean, when his epistles became recognized by the, by the church as scripture. We know it by uh, one of the epistles of Peter. He talks about Paul's writings. I didn't have time to look that up. It's in one of the epistles of Peter. Peter says about Paul's writings, he says, Paul's writings and other scriptures. Peter referred to Paul's epistles as scriptures. So when were, were Paul's epistles recognized as scriptures? As they were received. As they came in the mail, they were canonized in the scripture by the first century church. That's how respected the Apostle Paul was. That's how much the, the church thought of the Apostle Paul's intimate knowledge of God. That when he wrote a letter, they put it in the Bible. This is the man. And this is what the Bereans knew of Paul. His, his wisdom was so respected that as soon as he wrote a letter, they considered the scripture. Yet even when he preached the word to them, they searched the scriptures daily. Let's say, and that they received the word of readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Even the apostle Paul himself, they had to verify. Now check this out. See, if if, if Derek comes and preaches a message to me, I got this little tablet. I can get on here. I got this called God's sword. I go to the verses. He gave to me, I can read it, I can read it in context, verify what he said. They didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> the Marines did not have this. They didn't even have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. How many of you have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance? I know my brother has one, because it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people don't know the Strong Exhaustive A Strong's Exhaustive Concordance has every word of the Bible in it. If it I'll give you an example. If you go to the word if, I if, the strongest exhaustive concordance will tell you everywhere in the Bible you can find that word. If you know one word of any verse, you can find it with a strongest exhaustive concordance. It's pies. I recommend every Christian get one. But I recommend every Christian don't use it to learn God's word. <laughs> don't use it. To, so what they didn't have, guys, yeah, it's about this thick. Yeah. It's, it's bigger than the Bible. It's thick. But, uh, um, and it also, in the back, you can look, in, look up the, the Hebrew and Greek translation. It doesn't have the Aramaic, but it has the Hebrew and Greek of uh, a lot of the words in the Bible. But um, anyways, they didn't have a strong accordance. They didn't have a tablet. They didn't have a smartphone. They didn't have none of that. So how did they search the scriptures daily? Once he preached something was in Isaiah, did they read the entire book of Isaiah to verify what he said was true? No, they didn't have to do that. They had already read the entire book of Isaiah. They had already read the Torah. They had already read wow. the Psalms. They searched their own knowledge of the Scripture. <coughs> See, when Paul would say something that sounded familiar to them, be like, okay, I think Isaiah said something about that. Yeah, in fact, it's in this chapter right here. And they go read it. Come. Yeah, that does mean that. So they received his word with readiness, but they verified it because they searched the Scriptures daily. And Luke committed them. He said they were fair-minded. Fair-minded means wise, smart. They were smart and wise people. They didn't need a strong concordance. Because they, they studied God's word. They knew his voice. And when they recognized that something Paul said, when it sounded good, they still would go through their index in their mind and break out their, their, their scrolls and search the scriptures and find out where it, where it said that. And because of their knowledge, they knew it, whether it was in context or not. See, that's the problem with just trying to use a strong concordance. I can teach you anything I want. I can teach you any kind of made-up heresy I want to make up. And I can prove it to you with the strong tutorials. I remember I used to, I had someone one time came up to me and paid me a major compliment one time, which disturbed me. He meant it as a compliment, so I told him thank you. But he said, you know, I, I was telling people the other day, that, that message Jack West, man, I know what he preaches is true because he's got a scripture to back up everything he says. 
He's got a scripture back up everything he says. And I do. But that, that scares me because you're verifying what I say based upon me telling you. Wow. What would have been a compliment? What would have blessed me if he had said, that Jack West, I know what he preaches is true because I've got a scripture for everything he says. I love it when my brother Shannon is preaching nowadays because I've got a scripture for everything he's been teaching. When Derry pre preaches, I've got a scripture for everything. When Pastor Marty or Pastor Rob preaches, I listen to those men and I receive them already because I have scriptures to back up what they say. That's how you verify. You search the scriptures daily. Anyway, I'm spending too much time on that. <clears throat> All right. Using your own, it said, I, I said, be ready to receive. In other words, I'm not saying not to, to listen to these men of God. I'm not saying not to, 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 to go out and, and believe what they say, but verify with your own word. You know, uh, um, I wanted to say, they would verify the Apostle Paul, the most recognized man in the church, whose opinion was so respected that it was becoming scripture as he said, pretty much, as he wrote it, pretty much. We nowadays, that man that I'm talking about, that celebrity, I guarantee you, that whenever you quote the scripture that week, that scripture is re-quoted to friends and relatives. I wouldn't be surprised if some pastor got inspired based on, oh yeah, that's good. I can make a whole message out of that. I hope that didn't really happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if that does happen from time to time. The pastor gets inspired by the Bible says, ooh, I can preach a message off that. So it gets back. we don't verify some man on TV who's not even a preacher. Like I said, I wish I could tell you who he was. Ask me after the message when I'm not being filmed. But this man is not a preacher. He's a good man, but he's not even a preacher. His job has nothing to do with preaching. I'll tell you that much. But we receive his word with readiness, and we don't verify it. So yeah, receive it. Because Paul would, would, would highlight scriptures that they already knew. But he would enlighten them to him. They would verify to see if it were so. And once they saw it were so, so they already knew this stuff, but he brought it all together for them. What they already had stored in this. So receive words with readiness. I hope that you'll receive this word that I have for you with readiness. But I hope that you'll verify it. I hope that you'll, you'll do what this message says if you haven't already and start reading your Bible. <coughs> Using your own recognition of his voice. Not what I tell you, he says. Your own recognition of his voice. The second reason why people don't, don't read the Bible is because people don't think they can understand God's word. I have people tell me all the time, man, I've tried to read the Bible, but I don't understand all the these and the thous and all the stuff. The first Huh? What was the first one? Too much trust. Too much trust. Oh, they too much trust. Too much trust in the God. In the Sorry. All right. The second reason is they, they, they think they can't understand God's word. People tell me all the time, I, I've tried to read the Bible, read the Bible, but, you know, it, it confused me, all those D's and thou's. First, first of all, I say, are you serious? D's and thou's? How about shouts? Does that throw you off too? If the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, you're actually baffled as to what that's trying to tell you? <laughs> first of all, you don't know who thou is. You don't know what shout is. You don't know, what is this thou shalt? Who is thou shalt? Who is thou and what is shout? <laughs> that really baffles you? The these and the thou's are the reason why you don't understand God's word? <laughs> For real? Seriously? I mean, I, have, I can tell you how many times people tell me how to read, but then these and the thou's, they throw me out. Well, I'm telling you, they you, okay? So it's that. <laughs> Shout, just take the tea off. Okay, cool. We got it. <laughs> now you can read your Bible. <laughs> and, and, so, I mean, but you know what? And the first time I read the Bible all the way through from cover to cover, I was confused. And I was educated at this time, but I was confused. It threw me off. And I did not read. My Bible didn't have any D's, any thou's, and any shouts. I read a New International Version, the very first time I read it from cover to cover. It speaks in plain English. You know, and that's version, the good version. I don't think it's the best version, but it's a really good version. You know, and I, and I read it all the way through, and I was confused completely and totally thrown off. I didn't get none of it. And the reason why it, had none, it has nothing to do with the these and the thous ain't what's throwing you off. It's spiritual concepts. Wow. That's what's throwing you off. It's foreign to you. <laughs> what, the reason why people, and I came up with three reasons for, you know, I have to write all these down, but, but three reasons why people think they can't understand word, God's word. The first reason is that they forgot how they originally learned to understand. People forget how they originally learned to understand. There was a time in your life, check this out, I'm going to blow your mind. I'm going to give you a fact. I don't even know you, but I'm going to tell you something about you now. I know for a fact it's true. There was a time in your life when you didn't understand a word that was coming out of your mouth now. <laughs> I guarantee you that's a fact. There was a time in your life when you didn't understand a word that was coming out of your mama's mouth. But you loved her voice. You loved the way she looked at you. You loved the, the, the way she talked to you. So she sounded like Charlie, Brown, Charlie Brown's teacher. 
Oh, you guys need to teach him about the birds and the bees. Oh, man. That throws that whole doctrine out the window. One of the ways they come up with that doctrine is, is the third reason why people don't think they can understand the Bible, and that's because of messages that reinterpret through the original language. How they get that is uh, when Eve was talking to the devil, and he said, did God say with this tree you can't do that? And she said, God said we can't eat it. God said we can't even touch it. And like, you know what? God never said you can't touch it. So why did she bring that up? And they go into the, deep into the Hebrew, and they find out that that word touch can also be applied to have sex with. So when, when she was talking to the devil about touching, she was really talking, talking to the devil about sex. Wow. You know, and that's where they get that whole doctrine from. And they ignore Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, because it doesn't, you know, that's, that's the reason why a lot of preachers don't think that, because they've heard a lot of preachers, a lot of preachers do this. They don't all do it with the intent of doing stuff like that. But I hear it all the time. Preachers will go far, so far, the Bible is written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. They'll go so far into the Greek, so far into the Hebrew, they'll completely change the interpretation. They'll completely change the meaning of that scripture. And it discourages Christians. If they convince somebody, they do two things. They make themselves look really smart and strong. I got revelation about the Bible. You don't know because I'm smarter than you. The second thing they do is discourage Christians from reading God's word for themselves. They're serving the devil. The Bible says they're coming to talk to people who serve the devil and think they serve God. They are serving the devil. You, if you if you can go into if you have to, if you go into the Greek and the Hebrew so far that you change the meaning of the English, you are not teaching God. <coughs> You're not doing it. I don't care. You're doing things like that touch with sex. You know, I mean, you really can go into the Hebrew and come to that conclusion. If you go deep into it, you can do that with my message. You can get yourself a really good thick dictionary and take different words that I said and read all the possible definitions of every word I said and completely change my message. Or you can just listen to my message with context and try to understand what I'm saying. An example of that, you know, you don't, it's good to know the Hebrew and the Aramaic. It's good to know the Greek. But you don't have to know it. You can learn anything that you can learn through the Hebrew. Through, if you know Hebrew, word for word, and can read the original manuscript, I guarantee you anything that you can learn, you can learn the same thing with a good New King James Version. Or King James Version. Or New International Version. Stay away from the New World Translation. But um, that's the traumatized version of the Bible. But um, anyway, you can, you can learn the same thing with a good English Bible. And I'm going to prove it to you. Really. That's why I, and one of the verses I have is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to teach you something from the Hebrew that you could not know. If you, I'm going to teach you from Genesis chapter, chapter 1 verse 1 that you can only know if you know the Hebrew. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That right here, there is one of the greatest arguments for the Trinity in the Bible. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say nothing about the Trinity in the English. But in the Hebrew, it says, In the beginning, Elohim, Bara, the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Elohim, Bara, the heavens and the earth, which is a major grammatical error. The, the Hebrew word Bara should, should never follow a, a plural word because Elohim, if, you know, remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have they not forsaken me? He didn't call it Elohim, Elohim. He called it Eli, Eli. Because Eli is how you say God, singular. Elohim, if you add I-M to the back of a, of a Hebrew word, it's the same as putting an S on the end of an English word. It makes it plural. So what it actually says is in the beginning, God's created. In the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. But it goes deeper than that. This is where the grammatical error is. The word for created there is a singular word. It cannot follow a plural word. So a better translation for it would be, in the beginning, God's, he created the heavens and the earth. In one verse, it refers to God as both plural and singular. Either Moses made a major grammatical error. Moses was educated by the Egyptians. That would be the equivalent of being a Harvard Law graduate nowadays. Moses was educated by the most educated people in the world at the time. He didn't make grammatical errors. Plus, he was inspired by God. Or... Moses was not making a grammatical error. He was referring to a God that is both plural and singular. A God that is triune. In the beginning, God, he created the heavens and the earth. So I basically just contradicted myself when I said you, anything you can learn in the English, anything you can learn in the Hebrew and Aramaic, you can get from reading the English Bible. Well, you can. You can get that same doctrine in the same chapter from the English. Verse 26. He makes the same grammatical error that comes out of the English. 
It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our lightning. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. God said, Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. In two verses, it refers to God as both plural and singular. So everything that is taught you out of, out of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you could have already known if you just read the whole chapter of Genesis. That Moses believed in a in a singular plural God, a triune God. That's just one example. You don't have to know. It's good to know the Hebrew and Arabic. It's cool. It's interesting to know the first verse, the very first thing the Bible teaches is the Trinity. The absolutely opening verse of the Bible teaches the Trinity. That's a cool thing to know. But it's not necessary to understand doctrine. It will amplify you know, your knowledge. It's good if you have the time to study those things, but you don't need it. All you need is a good King James version, a good New King James version, and you'll understand God's Word. You don't have to, to, to go to school for years and become a scholar in the Hebrew and the Greek. Another reason, the third reason that people die is because, I already said that. <laughs> Now, all right, three reasons why people think they can't understand God's word is they forgot how they originally learned to understand. They, they don't understand how simple God's word, God's word really is. Like I said, third grade, how many weeks? And people will have, have confused them over the years with all this Hebrew and this Greek, trying to look really smart, preachers trying to look really smart. And it disturbs right. them when they do that. It's cool to do that. But you should always show people, you know, if, if, if some preacher goes, is, goes into the Greek and the Hebrew and magnifies something that the word is already saying. Like, um, that's pretty much what the Amplified Bible does, by the way. It puts every meaning and it basically blows up the verses and magnifies what they're saying. But they still say the same thing. They just say it in a lot longer-winded way. And it makes a little bit more sense to people. But so if a preacher does something like that, <coughs> but if he completely changes the meaning of that text, he'll have to walk out. If he completely changes the meaning, if he starts teaching you this proves that, that Eve had sex with the devil, and there's a whole lot of doctrines that can only come from people twisting and turning Greek and Hebrew definitions, get them and walk out. You don't want that. If you can't get it from the English, it's not God's word. Anyways, all right. Now the third thing, the reason why Christians don't read the Bible is they don't, they don't understand why they should study it. A lot of Christians don't understand why they should study the Bible. They know that they should. They know a good Christian should read God's Word. But that's about as far as it goes. You know, uh, the five five things I, I used to teach people, if you, if you never want to relapse, and I didn't follow my own advice, but five things that if you never want to backslide, I tell people you need to go to church, tithe, pray, read your Word, I can't remember the other one, fellowship. No, evangelize. Evangelize. Those are five things. I remember that five things. Huh? You should do the five things. I remember, you did, I remember you saying that one time. Yeah, there are five things. If you, if you go, I ain't going to get into that right now because that's a whole other message. But one of the things that you should read their Bible. They know that they should read their Bible. Like Christians know they should read their Bible, but they, they don't know why they should read their Bible. And uh, before I get into why you should read your Bible, one thing I should tell you, this is not why you should read your Bible. You don't read your Bible to be entertained. It's, I think it's the number one reason why Christians why? stop reading their Word. They think that and what, I, what I was going to do at this point, but I wasn't sure how much time I would have. I'm doing really, really good on time. Awesome. <laughs> yes, I should have put in all that stuff. I left out a whole lot of stuff because I was worried about time. Because usually when I come here to preach, Shannon will get up and introduce me for about, well, yeah, Derry will get up and do the time knocking message for about 20, 25 minutes. Minutes and then Shannon will introduce me for another half hour and then I'll have like 20 minutes of preaching and then they didn't do that to me today so I could have done but anyways yeah, I, sent, I sent Shannon a text and I vowed to be quick <laughs> well I love it though I mean it's cool but I just because I know that that's how they normally do stuff here I you know I, I cut a lot of stuff short because I also saw a post in Moses that it will be done at 745 Right. Like, I don't know if I, I, might, I might be in the middle of a sentence, everybody get a walk out as I do. Looking down promptly at 745. So I'm like, okay, I better cut this. I better put all the stuff in there that I want to say. But one of the things I was going to do, I was going to pick a good long chapter like Numbers or Exodus, <laughs> oh, pretty much after chapter 15, right? Exodus chapter 1 to, 15, to verse 15. To chapter 1 to chapter 15 is really cool, but then it gets like, oh, wow. 
But I was going to say, have you turned to that? And I was just going to start reading one of them big ass books. Then so and so big ass so and so who lived for 300 years, and big ass so and so by so and so who lived for 20 more years, and then big ass so and so. And then also big ass so and so who big ass so and so, and then really cool, interesting thing for my verse, and then big ass so and so, big ass so and so, and all the time I read And it goes on for chapters and chapters and chapters. And I was going to read a whole chapter, and the whole time I'd be like, man, isn't this cool? Isn't this powerful? Man, this is powerful. You guys getting this? Are you getting this? I was going to get really excited about it. Like, man, this is powerful. And then I was going to teach you two things about the Bible. I was going to tell you, number one, the Bible does not say anywhere in the Bible does it say you must enjoy everything you read in God's Word. And another thing it says in the Bible is thou shalt not lie. And I have to quit lying at that point and tell you, y'all, this is boring. <laughs> this is boring. There are parts of the Bible that are boring. And I'm talking to the point of torture. <laughs> like I talked about Exodus chapter 15. After you, you, once you get past, I think it's about chapter 15. Once you get past that, he starts going into intimate detail as to how to build everything. You know, how to build the the tent, how to build the tent, how many sacrifices to do before the tent, what you should do if they have a blemish on this one, how many rubies, how much gold, how much should the gold weigh, where should you get the gold, when should you put the gold in? I mean, just on and on and on and on and on and on it goes. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's boring. It's really, really, really boring. And that's okay. But see, a lot of Christians, when they don't expect that, a lot of Christians, they'll start reading God's Word, right? And they'll think, because I've heard so many preachers talk about, man, this book is powerful. I love this book. This book will bless you. This book will do this for you. So they think, oh, wow, that's going to be really cool. And they start reading, and they get bored to death, and they start getting condemnation. Like, man, I'm getting bored. This is the most, like I said earlier, this is the most supernatural book that the world has ever known or will ever know. According to our own context. And the Christian sitting there reading and getting bored to death, feeling like, man, how can I be sitting there reading a book that's so powerful and I don't understand a word it said? I don't get why do I need to know who so and so's grandpa was? You know, why do I need to know this? Why do I need to know exactly how much to the ephah? I don't even know what an ephah is. How much the gold should weigh? You know, it's like, why do I need to know all this? And they get bored and they get discouraged and they think, man, I must not be doing this right. And they give up and they stop reading at that point. Wow. Because they went into it thinking it was going to be entertaining the whole time. And this book is extremely entertaining. There's some, there's some parts of it that's really exciting. There's some parts of it that's really scary. There's some parts of it that's downright disturbing. Like, hmm? What? She, <laughs> she, she called me up to tell me she read about what Lot's, Lot's daughters did. Some of y'all are just like, did you know? <laughs> Still play this to this day. And that all sits back to one sin by Lot's wife. Lot, Lot looked back. All she did was look back, turn into a pillar of salt. As a result of that one moment of doubt, Israel to this day is still played by the Edomites and the Moabites. The two children, the offspring, because Lot's daughters got worried, they had a lot of to continue, so they got drunk, and they're several, the Moabites got pregnant, and that's what started those two peoples. But she read, so there's some things, I'm like, what? <laughs> It's just like, did I get this from a porn spot? I this was a porn <laughs> Man, if you do know the Hebrew and the Greek, I mean, if you do know the Hebrew, don't read the Song of Solomon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that could be in the, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that could be in the porno magazine, some of that stuff. It gets deep. You know what I mean? But so this book isn't, but some of it is boring. And you, if you go into it, if you are prepared for that going in, no, I'm not reading this book to be entertained. That's not the reason I'm telling you to read God's right. words. It's not to If you know that going in, then when you get to that part, you're mentally prepared for it and you'll keep reading. You won't get discouraged. You won't think I must be a filthy yeah. Christian. I must not be holy enough because this doesn't excite me. I'm bored to death. And you don't like feeling like that, so you stop reading. You think the rest of the Bible is going to be like that. It's not. You got to get through it. You got to get through it. Get through it. Because you'll get through it and get some more excited stuff. Later, they'll come up with some even more boring stuff than you saw before. I'm, I'm sorry. You will. But it's cool. Keep reading it. Because it's that boring stuff that later on, the third or fourth time you're about to all of a sudden, you're going to get, oh, that's why I needed to know how much go. And all of a sudden, it's going to come through to you. You know the prayer of Jabez that everybody loves? That, that there's a thing called the prayer of Jabez. There's a whole book about it and all that. That you would enlarge my courts or whatever you know what I'm talking about. That is a little bitty, little bitty verse, verse in the Bible, hidden among a whole bunch of them boring verses I was just talking about. Yep. That one you would never know if you stopped reading at the boring ones. 
The whole prayer of Jabez, which is a major industry now, the prayer of Jabez, there's books about it, there's songs about it, there's messages about it, everything else. That's a little bit of verse hidden in one of them really, really long, boring chapters. So that's why you go ahead and read them anyway, because there's nuggets in there. But know that you're not going to be entertained. All right. Now, here's why you do read God's Word. You read it so that you won't be deceived. That's the number one reason, so that you won't be deceived. As you get to know God's Word, you come and know God. You come and know Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Now, I think I left out some of the verses I've been doing before. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. This is the New Testament, right, Dan? <laughs> Hezekiah. Yeah, too. It's right next to Hezekiah. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. My Bible sticks together. It's the New Review Bible. Okay. It says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, into the context of that, it talks about the Holy Spirit. If you read the, the whole chapter that talks about the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth and stuff like that. And it says, it says uh, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Spirit will compare spiritual things with spiritual. And that's why we have, and, and we have the mind of Christ. But how do we have that mind of Christ? Because we understand spiritual things. <coughs> Remember how I taught you to understand spiritual things. Keep reading. It's, it's not the these and the doubts that can confuse you. You can read the message, which is probably the most watered down paraphrase in existence today. And it will confound you, parts of it. It will confound you. Because it's not the these and the doubts that's the problem. But you have to understand spiritual things. It not, doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you're not saved if you don't understand them. Just like it didn't mean you weren't human because you didn't know English. He's just a baby. You know, if you haven't started reading God's Word yet, I don't care if you've been saved for 20 years, you're still a baby. You start listening to your mama and learn English. You start reading your Abba's Word, Abba means Father or Daddy, and learn spiritual things. Then the mind of Christ will open up within you, and spiritual will be compared to spiritual. <clears throat> uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning cast craftiness of deceitful plotting. That we should no longer be children. And I said, Amen. you know, don't be a baby anymore. Start reading. Start listening. Start learning. Start understanding. Get to know God's voice. So that you won't be why? So you won't be tossed to and fro. Carried out with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. These people purposely will mislead you. There are people that will purposely mislead you. For their own gain, for whatever reason, for power. Jim Jones. All those were really good God fearing Christians. They didn't know the word. They ended up doing funny Kool Aid. It can happen. Enough preaching, enough time. If you don't know God's word, if you're good enough to trust me, and you know that I'm preaching God's word because I have a scripture to back it up, then I can lead you down to you don't want to if you give me enough time. But if you trust me because you have a scripture to back up everything I say, then I ain't taking you nowhere God don't want you to be. I can't. Because you'll search the scriptures daily and you're verified by your own recognition of the first voice, not by your tablet. Not by your strong, exhaustive concordance, but by the things that you have already stored up within your mind. The voice recognition system that you have in your mind. Uh, another good one, Second Timothy. All the keys are together in the New Testament. If I need a book starting with T, you're close. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 3 or 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
but according to their own desire, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachings, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What yes. three and four? She put 34. Yes, she said. I was like, wait, you're trying to trick us again. I was going to stop you. <laughs> no. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse so you read the scripture, we read it, we ain't playing, we look at it. I said I grew up, I ain't doing that no more. Okay, I was like a 25 year old preacher when I used to do that.
a tattoo of uh, my girlfriend's name, which is kind of, it's actually my daughter's name, they both have the same name. Uh, <laughs> 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 This is my daughter's name is Vanessa. In fact, when I told my daughter I was dating a girl named Vanessa now, she told me I had to get another tattoo underneath it that says, my daughter. That's my tattoo. That's my tattoo. But, you know, I don't worship my daughter. You know, I just love her. And, and, you know, she had this thing about all of her friends, daddies had tattoos of their names. I'm trying to explain to them all of her friends were Mexican. And that's right. But she would not drop me until finally I got her name on one side and I got this other guy, Elijah over there. <laughs> you know. And uh, so I mean it's it's to honor my kids it's because I love my kids. I got three more kids. I'm gonna get them tatted too. You know, I'm, I, if I have any more kids, I'm gonna get them tatted too. And it has nothing to do with idol worship. That's because I know God's word. But anyway, back to what I'm saying. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, the New Testament is the Old Testament real. Of course, this subverse actually works. In the Old Testament, they didn't have Jesus yet. They didn't have the light. In other words, they were blind. And they were walking around, think of it like this. There's a major cliff right there, right? And to a bunch of blind people in complete darkness, God gave Moses the diameters of that cliff. The, the, the cliff, if you can feel the wall, then you are 20 feet from the cliff. If you can feel the chalkboard, then you are 15 feet from the cliff. If you can feel the pulpit, then you are 13 feet. If, if you get to this, you are in sin. You are in sin because you're about to fall asleep. Turn around, what? Don't do this. Don't get all the way to these little shelves. That's what the Old Testament law is. That's all it is. There's a guy to, and people in darkness are where the cliff is. What did Jesus do? He came along and turned on, turned on the lights. Now, that's, that's what grace is. Now, that's why we're free from the law. I don't need to know how many paces from this table that cliff over there is anymore. I don't need to know how many paces from this pulpit that cliff is. I don't have, I don't, I'm not singing if I'm standing right here anymore. But the cliff is still there. Homosexuality is still wrong. That's just one example. All it says, killing. You know, people say, oh, that we're not under the law anymore. Oh, then shoot, this, my neighbor won't take his trash can and he keeps being out front. I'm going to go shoot him in we're not under the law anymore. It's about grace now. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I still can't murder? I can't murder? So who is it that, get, that determines which one of these laws is, is, doesn't count by grace? No one. The cliff is still there. It's still wrong to kill my neighbor. The cliff is still there. But now we can see it. We're illuminated. How do we get illuminated? By knowing God's word. Psalm chapter 1, 119, verse 105. If you open your Bible right to the same, you'll probably be in Psalms. <clears throat> one of my favorite scriptures this whole chapter if, if you really want to be inspired to read God's word read Psalm 119 it's the longest chapter in the Bible yeah. and it's all about reading the Bible thy word, thy word, thy word I love your word it talks, everyone, every time we talk about precepts or commandments or words I'm talking about the same thing it's about his word Psalm 119 is all about reading God's word but what it says in verse 105 is very important it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you understand God's word, I don't need to tell you where the cliff is. Right. Wow. You know where it's at. But I'm still, if you are about to fall off the cliff, I'm going to think maybe you got your eyes closed and a good preacher is going to pull you back. You still, it's still our job to rebuke one another. It's still our job. That's another thing. Because Christians don't know the word, the world has successfully crippled the church. And I'm going to say something that a lot of people are in this room are probably going to disagree with. And if, if, once you start reading your word, you're going to get it later, though. It is good and godly to judge people. Yes, it is. It is. It is good and godly to, but the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. Jesus said that. I know because it's in red. <laughs> Jesus said a lot of other stuff in that same chapter. Genesis, I mean, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Genesis, not lest you be judged. He compares that to removing a speck from your brother's eye. He said, how dare you try to remove a speck from your brother's eye if you've got a beam in your own eye? And he didn't, he didn't conclude by that. First, remove the beam from your own eye, and then don't ever try to remove the speck from your eye. Remember, removing the speck from your brother's eye is compared to judging. So if you're never supposed to judge, that verse would have been on to say, don't ever remove the speck from your brother's eye. First remove the beam from your own eye, then don't you ever try to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You hypocrite. No. He says, first remove the beam from your own eye so that you may see clearly. 
so that you may see clearly. So it's our job to follow the light and be an example. I am, and in that, same, it's in that chapter that he says you will know them by their fruit. Wait a second, he's saying if I judge, I'll be judged. How am I supposed to know them by their fruit? I heard Walter Jack say the most ignorant thing one time. Yeah, it says you'll know them by fruit, but it doesn't tell us to be fruit inspectors. Actually, yes, it does. Read it again. You will know them by their fruit. How did you get from that? Man, read that to a third grader. How would you get you will know them by their fruit to say that, that, that we're not supposed to be fruit inspectors? Do you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul rebuked the Corinthians? Went off on them, and guess what? Because they were mad at somebody. There was someone in that congregation that was sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul said, how are you still letting him in your church? Put him out of your church. He said, I'm not even there. I've already judged him. He goes on to chapter 6 and said, don't you know that one day you'll judge angels? And you can't even see that that's wrong? This man is sleeping with his daddy's wife? Wow. And you can't even protect her. This chapter 2 goes off on again for not letting the guy back in. He's <laughs> like, I ain't even been it already. Come on, we're supposed to be loving. <laughs> so it's, the point of judgment isn't hate, it's love. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. I love you, so I'll judge you. If you love me, you'll judge me right back. Vanessa said she saw a shirt one time and she wants to get it. Said, it said, Oh, yes, I am secretly judging you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, cool, lovers. Don't secretly judge nobody. I'm going to tell you. If you're doing something wrong, I'm going to tell you. If you stink, I'm going to tell you. But it says in Matthew chapter 18, that's nothing. In other words, I know how to do it. Matthew chapter 18 says, if this man right here stinks, I'm going to wait until after the group is over. I'm going to pull him to the side and say, hey, man, so I got you some soap. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need soap? I want you to stink. Come on. You smell a little funny. You smell a little funny. That's loving, man. I'm not going to let him keep going around in public smelling like that. Because I love him so much, I'm not going to judge him. And everywhere he goes, he got people talking about him behind his back. He got people being rude to him. He got people looking at him funny, and he don't even know why. And why? Because I am too loving and not judgmental to ever tell that man that he stinks. That's hateful. That is hateful. That's not loving at all. And I know that it's right to judge. You know, there's a whole book in the Old Testament called Judges, and it's not about a bunch of filthy hypocrites. I can go on and on on that one. That, that ain't even in my notes. That's a little sidetrack, a little side issue. That one was free. Yeah, that one was free. <laughs> <laughs> because you know what God's work, but the devil has crippled the church over this doctrine. Did you know that 50 years ago, the most memorized and quoted verse in America was John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but receive eternal life. Now, the most memorized quote and quoted verse in America is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not unless you be judged. Wow. That is the most quoted and memorized verse in this country today. Why is that? Because 50 years ago, we was all about looking out for each other. We was all about loving each other. Nowadays, we're all about, I don't want to be held accountable to no one. Wow. We have become a hedonistic generation. Wow. Hedonism is, is put, puts pleasure above all else. If it feels good, do it. Be true to you. Be true to God, and you'll be true to you. So... <clears throat> Because we don't want to be held accountable no more. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7 says, Rebuke a, 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 a wicked man, and he will hate you. But if you rebuke a wise man, he will love you. I had a point out to Vanessa the other night, not immediately. <laughs> Sometimes when she rebuked me, it takes me a couple of days to figure out that I needed to hear that. Right, <laughs> <it's done. laughs> I was telling a joke. I'm going to go ahead and tell myself, tell a joke. We, we was at this church at a barbecue, and there's a porn shop next door. Right? And I was just like, it's weird to me that it's a part of this church been there for years and it's still a porno shop next door. And, you know, I ain't going to judge that church. You know, it's sometimes when it is inappropriate to judge. But, you know, and it, it was on my mind, just as a joke, I said, uh, we're sitting in the barbecue with my friends. I said, uh, later on, we're going to go next door. I see this new movie I heard is coming out. You know, just trying to be funny. <laughs> it seemed funny in my head. She said, that ain't a joke a preacher would say. In front of all our friends. <laughs> this wise man did not love her at that time. I'm just trying to get together and sit here. This porno shop next door. Just, you, know, you know I'm not really going to go next door and see the movie. You know, I was like, oh, God, it's embarrassing me. You know, rebuke cool a racist man. He would love you. But not immediately. It doesn't say immediately. <laughs> A few couple days later, you 
uh, I realized, you know what, that's right, man. All these people that I was sitting with, the people that I hope to live to the Lord someday, and here I am making jokes about the Lord and seeing the Lord. Right. Wow. I became wise. Did my girl love me enough to tell me? Nah, nah. That ain't funny. Everybody's sitting there laughing at her, and she's looking at me like, because it wasn't funny. Funny moment. And she was loving to tell me that. You know, I'm not perfect. And like I said, I'm going to tell myself there. <clears throat> Another reason why you want to know God's word is so that you can effectively preach the gospel. That's a good segue to that because I'm at, I have those people that I hope to bring from the Lord someday. So that you can effectively preach the gospel. I told you guys when I was telling my testimony before about how I accidentally brought somebody to the Lord. You know, this guy was, was telling me, and, and I wouldn't even in my right mind at the time. I don't, you know, it's all that again, but I wouldn't even in my, my right mind at the time. And we're sitting there having a conversation. This guy said, you know, all religion... It's purposely made to where nobody can understand it. It's purposely made to where nobody can understand it, so nobody knows exactly what they believe. It's to take the, the gospel, for example. That's the best one. No one can understand the gospel. I can understand the gospel. Still, so you can't. It's not possible. See, I can't. And I started declaring the gospel. We had like a four hour conversation about the gospel. I went through the scriptures, started telling them that, that he got saved that night. Wow. And this guy was high at the time and hated God and hated everything. For, uh, it's still serving to the Lord to this day, from what I've heard. Last I heard, he's still serving the Lord, studying to be a minister and everything else. But all of his life, he got to church, and no one was able to explain the gospel to him. But because I knew it. You know, because all I could tell was Jesus loves you. All I could tell was Jesus oh, died for you. All I could tell was if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. They couldn't tell why. I, I went to all those questions. Even why does there have to be a hell? I know the answer to that. It's in Genesis chapter 3. Maybe another message. The answer to why there has to be a hell. You know, I uh, uh, why did Jesus Christ have to die? I'll get into that in a second. But um, Matthew, <clears throat> so as, if you can, if you know God's word, it's easier to explain God's word to people. You know, like uh, I used to say, a lot of Christians say they know the Bible real well. Some preachers, one thing used to, that I used to think was fun, and now I don't feel so good about it anymore. Is Christians going around telling people how well they know the Bible. I would ask them ten simple questions about the Bible, and embarrass them. Embarrassed the preachers, like I would embarrass preachers. What's, what's the just us? Oh, you know, Bible, 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 yeah, what's the plot of the book of Hosea? Uh, you know, and that's a book. If, if you read Hosea, that's a book where the plot is extremely interesting. If you read it, you're gonna know the plot. I'll tell you, uh, God, his prophets represented him, right? And God believed that he was married to a prostitute because Israel was whoring after other gods. Right? So he tells Hosea, check this out. I want you to go marry a prostitute. That's what he Remember I said, some of it is disturbing. He made one of his prophets marry a prostitute. He said, so that I can restore her. And the book of Hosea is basically about him restoring a prostitute and made her good wife. You ever heard that saying, you can't make a whore into a housewife? Whoever came up with that, you've never heard that? You can't make a whore into a housewife? I've heard that. Maybe it's a shit, right? <laughs> They actually spell whore. I was saying, yeah. Yeah, they actually spell whore, H-O-E, in that. But <laughs> whore, into a, you, can't, you can't make a whore into a housewife. That's an old saying, right? Whoever came up with that saying never read the book of Hosea because God made a whore into a housewife. That's what the plot of Hosea is. God making a whore into a housewife. And it was symbolic of the fact that God made restore Israel unto him. So it's a very interesting. So if you read it through one time, you need to be able to answer that question. You know, but I'm asking, what's the plot of the book of Hosea? What's that book in the New Testament that's all about faith? That lists a whole bunch of things that, that people have done, that people in faith have done. For the New Testament, one time you know, that's Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Faith. Right. You know? Where is that verse that says you must be born again? Where does it say that in the New Testament? John 3 3. You know, these are things we need to know from a preacher of the gospel effective. And people are like, people always say we've got to be born again. Where does it say that in the Bible? I can tell. Jesus said it to Nicodemus. You must be born again in John chapter 3, verse 3. I mean, that's just one example. All right. You know, my son got approached twice in the last few weeks. You told me about that. <laughs> Did he tell you about that? He got approached twice walking the street talking about Jesus came in 1948. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole movement, and they were sitting there trying to convert him. Yeah. And so me and him got an interesting conversation. About that's him. another reason why we didn't know God's word. That's why people are being deceived. I just talked about that. So that you can't be deceived. There's so many people that don't know God's word, but they think they know His word because they've been taught to it by so many people that they trust. I used to think I knew God's word before I read the Bible all the way through. 
I read the Bible all the way through the first time I was 20 in, in jail. But when I was 18, I remember working in a hotel and explaining to this guy that I was basically a scholar of the Bible. And I knew I was a scholar of the Bible because, check this out, I've been to church uh, at least 10 times. I, I saw that movie called The Bible, and I saw The Ten Commandments. What you want to know about the Bible? I'm the man. Come to me. <laughs> I know it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not an unusual case. I know all kinds of Christians. That's why I'm asking those questions. When people tell me, so many Christians think they know the Bible, you mean, they may not as extreme as my little 18-year-old dumb, dumb guy was, but there are grown men. That believe with all their heart that they know the Bible well, and they've never read it once because they're so trusting with what they've been taught. And they have no idea whether what they've been taught is true or not because they've never searched. They received it readily, and that's a good thing too, to receive a word from Jesus readily. But verify out of the resources of your own recognition of God's voice. God's word is God's voice. He said, My sheep know my know my voice. We know his voice because we read it. Like, uh, I was telling y'all that the third time I read God's Bible, third or fourth time, things started to come together, right? The fifth time, I started really getting things. The sixth time, it started speaking to me. See, this is logos. Right here. Logos is a Greek word. And I said, you know, I changed the meaning, but this is going to enhance it. Logos means the written word. Right? There are two different words for word in Greek. Logos and rhema. I named my daughter rhema. Rhema is the spoken word. As you begin to read God's word, as it begins to open up to you, God will highlight scriptures to you. And it will become rhema. God will speak them to you. God spoke Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 to me while I was locked up this last time. He said, I, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Wow. You know, and, and he told me that he wanted to set me free from my captivity. And I knew that was for me for two reasons. One is because God spoke it to me. As I was reading it, I heard his voice. <coughs> and the second reason I know this is the thing. I've heard people tell me before, I've been talking before, that all those promises in the Old Testament were for the Israelites. Okay. All those promises in the Old Testament were for the Israelites. But they're for us. Romans chapter 10 says we've been grafted onto the vine. I thought I had it until I'm sorry. But uh, Romans chapter, chapter 11 says we've been grafted onto the vine. We are the Israelites. We are sons of Abraham. So all the promises to the sons of Abraham are for Esau. I'm in Romans chapter 29. Okay, get to my closing scripture. Since I have one passed. I thought I had more time. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, What's your closing scripture? Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter so 10. We have been given, I'm just going to read these last notes. We have been given the mind of Christ to teach with the same authority. Uh, wrong, Matthew chapter 7 verse 29, you have to look it up, says that he taught with authority. Amen. The reason why Jesus spoke with authority is because he was the word. We can, teach, we can speak with authority if we get to know the word. It says we've been given the mind of Christ to teach with the same authority. But to have the mind, the, but to have that mind, you must know his voice. You must know his word. He taught with authority because he is the word. We can teach with that same authority because we know the word personally. If I ignore his word, I don't know him. If I only communicate via hearsay and message, messenger, as in preachers. Like, if the only time I've ever communicated with Shannon is, is Derry constantly telling me what Shannon had to say, I don't know Shannon. Right. 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 If we, Thank uh, you. Amen. But if I know his word personally, then I know him personally. I know his voice because through reading the logos, I have experienced Rhema. And the closing chapter is Romans chapter 10, verse 8, 9, and 10. It says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. For this is the word of faith that we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart, man believeth unto salvation. Everything that, that God you say was his word. It says you have to get his word into your mouth and into your heart. It says for with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. How does that work? What did it say confess? It says you must confess the Lord Jesus. How will that save you? Real simple. There was a time in your life when you thought that you was God. I got to preach fast. Now there was a time in your life when you thought that you were God. Even though you didn't say it straight out, even though you didn't admit it to yourself. If you thought that you were God, that you would probably get to heaven because you ain't as bad as the next guy. I used to have a friend that... Um, had two wives, drank 40 for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, got high all day, would cheat on both of his wives, and could not express himself without the effort, but he knew he was going to have because his neighbor, man, that guy was filthy. <laughs> he was way better than his neighbor. At least he wasn't as bad as Hitler. If you think that you're a good person and you can get to heaven because 
Yeah, least straight is bad as him, then you're determining the standard. You're determining right is right and wrong. You are confessing yourself as Lord. But the moment that you realize you ain't gonna get yourself nothing but hell with your righteousness, that's when you fall to your knees and you say, Jesus, only you can save me. Amen. And then it says, uh, with, with the heart man believeth unto salvation. How does that work? But what did it say to believe? It says to believe that God raised him from the dead. That God raised him from the dead. How will that say? Real simple. If you can believe that. If you can believe that God raised himself from the dead, then you can believe that God can raise you up out of a crack habit, out of a beating wife habit, out of a porno addiction, out of a whatever. If God can raise himself from the dead, he can raise you up from your sin. That is the formula by which we obtain salvation. I want to tell you, that is the formula by which you obtain any promises in the Word of God. Anything in the Word of God that God promised you, if you know His Word, if you confess it and you believe it, you can have it if it's promised in His Word. That's the thing. You don't know it's promised in His Word just because I told you. I'm not naming and claiming preaching. Just because I told you it's promised. You'll know this promise. The reason why I'm not in prison right now and I should have been is because I believed Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. And I spoke it. I told my lawyer, who told me I was going to prison, that I was not going to prison because God told me I wasn't. I was able to preach that with authority. My lawyer is looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm looking at my lawyer like he's stupid. She's stupid. She didn't know what I knew. I was able to say that with authority. No, I'm going to get probation. My lawyer said, there's no way. I said, my God said, he's already made the way. Mm. All right. Amen. <laughs> wow.